lesson for today is taken from the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 8, beginning with verse 27. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus went on his way with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, Jesus asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered, Jesus, John the Baptist. And others said, Elijah, and still others, oh, one of the prophets. But Jesus asked them, Who do you say that I am? Peter spoke up, and he answered Jesus, and he said, You are the Messiah. Thou art the Christ. And Jesus sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then Jesus began to teach them, that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed. And on the third day, rise again. Jesus said all this quite openly. And Peter took Jesus aside. And he began to rebuke Jesus. But turning and looking at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on earthly things. Jesus then called the crowd with his disciples, and he said to them all, If any of you want to become my followers, my disciples, let you first deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes to the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise to the Lord Christ. Will the congregation please be seated. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, on this 17th Sunday after Pentecost, we thank you for the opportunity to come to St. Paul's Wurttemberg on this beautiful day. Open our hearts and minds as we wrestle with today's Gospel lesson. Help us to understand it so that we might know more about you, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Okay, here we go. We're still working in the Gospel of St. Mark. Last week, we're in Mark chapter 7. Now we're up to Mark chapter 8. Remember, we're preaching through the Gospel of Mark during this entire year. So, stop. Where did we start? The first line of the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 1, verse 1, says this. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark opens his gospel by proclaiming the title of Jesus, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Son of God. Now we have to wait until Mark chapter 8 when we get more light on this subject. So Mark chapter 8 is the exact center of the gospel of Mark. There are 16 chapters in the gospel of Mark. Chapter 8 is right in the middle. Right in the middle is this extremely important pericope. That's the scripture reading. A little block of material here. It's not many words here, but you know what? It's really important. Really important stuff here today. So, you know, make sure in your Bible, you know, highlight this in yellow and make sure you sort of work in and around this gospel lesson. It's the, it's the heart of the gospel of, of, uh, of, of Mark. So let's get going here. Jesus went out. Stop. At this point of the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is on the road. He's walking around. He's on the road. Okay? Where is he? Well, last week, he was, two weeks ago, he was up here at Tyre and Sidon, up here. Remember, get a good, a good reference Bible of the match set in Phoenicia. And then, this week, he's in and around Mount Hermon up here. He's over here. His home base of operations is Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee. Down here is Jerusalem. That's where the temple is. So remember, the Pharisees and scribes came from Jerusalem 75 miles up here to try to trap Jesus. 
This territory is the territory of who? Herod Antipas. Stop. I don't understand this. How many Herods are there in the Bible? A lot of them. Too many of them. This is my, this is my Flavius Josephus, which everyone should read this book. Right? Dave Barkstead t tells me that if I talk about a book, I should hold the book up so people can see it on the video. This is Flavius Josephus. This is the family tree of the Herods. Okay, this right here? Okay, they're like the Kennedys, right? It just says Herod, but which Herod are you talking about? There are like three or four or five generations of Herods that are in the New Testament. Herod the Great is the ancestor of all these Herods. He had 10 wives with a bunch of sons. And that means that they're competing and fighting each other to see who gets to be the, 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 the next dynasty, the next, the next successor to Herod the Great. Now, there were two sons that we are interested in today. The first one is named Herod, Herod Philip, right? And his territory is up here in and around <coughs> Mount Hermon. That's where Caesarea Philippi is, up here. The area in Galilee is Herod Antipas. Remember the story? I'm telling you this because you won't understand unless I talk about this. Herod Philip's wife is named Herodias. She's the granddaughter of Herod the Great. It's like an incest thing. She runs off with Herod Antipas, who's the half-brother of Herod Philip. I know, it gets really complicated, right? So John the Baptist said, you can't marry that woman because it's, it's your family. It's, it's a violation of the holiness code in the book of Leviticus. And what did Herodias do? She plots to have John the Baptist arrested and then executed. He's beheaded. So Jesus is from Nazareth in Galilee. That's the domain or territory of Herod Antipas. Now he's up here in the domain of Herod Philip. It would be like... Um, Oh no, I'm, I'm a wanted man in New York. I'm going to go to go to Canada and hide out. So you're outside of the jurisdiction of Governor Hochul. That's, that's what's going on here. Okay? Now, his disciples, he's on the road. And he goes from up here, he goes to the Decapolis down here. These are Greek cities. That are, again, outside the realm of Herod Antipas. Now he's up here at Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is 9,232 feet above sea level. Is that pretty impressive? Yeah, not bad. Colorado's got, you know, the 14,000 foot peaks. So these are like major, this is a major mountain here. Mount Washington is what, 6,800 feet above sea level? That's the highest mountain in New England. So it's a pretty high mountain. And it's e even more impressive if you go Mount Hermon, Sea of Galilee, 680 feet below sea level. And then the Dead Sea, 1,400 feet below sea level. It's the lowest spot on earth. So you go from the Dead Sea to Mount Hermon up here, it's about a 10,000 foot change in elevation. That's kind of impressive. Now, Mount Hermon gets a lot of snow, and when the snow melts, where does it go? It runs down the mountain, and it gets into like little crevices and so on, and it gushes out at the foot of the mountain. One of these places is, it's a grotto. What's a grotto? It's a side of a mountain, and there's water gushing out of the hillside. That's the spot where today's story takes place. Now, ancient people, primitive people, they believe that grottos are places where there are openings to the underworld. What's in the underworld? The gods, right? These are religious shrines. It goes back to the Old Testament days. You've heard of Baal? He's the Canaanite god, the storm god. This was a Baal shrine like 4,000 B.C., and then when the Greeks come along, Alexander the Great, that's 333 BC, he makes it into a Greek temple system. And who do they worship there? Pan, who's Pan? Remember, he's a man from here up and a goat from, from the waist down. He's the God of nature. And he's related to Bacchus or Dionysius. So you go out into the woods and you get drunk until you see the gods you know, the nymphs and all that, the fawns, that's, that's Pan. In other words, it's kind of like the religion of people in Woodstock. It's the same kind of thing, right? Go out in the woods, you know, and do weird things. That's Pan worship, okay? Is this a popular God? You don't have to tell these people to go to church, you know, because it involves all kinds of nefarious activities. So it's a Pan shrine. Then along comes Caesar Augustus. In those days, the decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world, okay, 
So when Caesar Augustus died in 14 BC or AD, they made it, they, the Senate proclaimed him to be a god. So what do gods need? A temple. So this site that was a Baal shrine, that was a Pan shrine, is now a shrine to, to Caesar Augustus. It's a pagan temple, in other words. That's a very strange thing. So the question is, what is Jesus doing at a place like this? Isn't that interesting? I mean, it's like a, it's a pagan, a demonic worship site. And for pagans, this is a very important site. But for Christians, this is the spot where one of the most important events in the life of Christ takes place. Isn't that interesting? I think it's strange. Why is that? Well, because Christ is in the face of Satan himself, in the belly of the beast. And there he, he, he receives the confession of St. Peter. This is, this is a very important site in the life of ministry. And it's up here at the foot of Mount Hermon. Okay, up here. So, Jesus is up at the Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asks his disciples, stop. In ancient Greece, right, there's a great teaching method, right? Roxanne, you just read about the tongue of a teacher and so on, right, in the book of James. A teacher, a good teacher, it's called the peripatetic method by Aristotle. What does that mean? You don't just sit there like this. Our students, they sit there in class and they have their iPhone in one hand and they have their computer laptop in the other and they're on Facebook, they're buying things on eBay, they're talking to their friends, nobody's paying attention to the lecture up front. It's passive learning. The peripatetic method is, come on, we're going for a walk. Aristotle walks and as he walks, he teaches. There's something about you moving around when you receive the teaching that makes the teaching stick or something. So, so there's something to the peripatetic method. I really like it. Uh, my college students on a day like this would always say to me, can we have class outside today? Yeah, I was born yesterday, right? <laughs> what happens to them? Half of them will leave between there and the little tree that you're trying to find out there. And the other half will be looking at their friends, waving at them. Hey, I'm talking to you on the cell phone. How are you doing today? In other words, the, the teaching value is useless if you try to do, do modern students like this. But in the ancient world, they would actually walk around and teach and learn. It's called the peripatetic method. If you're a Greco-Roman reader, which is like who Mark is writing for, you're going to say, wow, Jesus is teaching like Aristotle, right? In other words, hey, I, I didn't quite know what to think about Jesus, but I like Aristotle, and so Jesus is up there. He's one of the great teachers of all time. So he's walking along, and he's teaching his disciples. Stop. Who is Jesus? He's the master. He's the rabbi. He's the teacher, the professor. Who are the students? These are disciples, students. That's what a disciple means, a disciple of Christ. Who are you? You're a disciple of Christ. I'm a disciple of Christ. So we get to follow along with Jesus during one of his, his teaching times. And what does that mean? Clean out your ears and pay attention. And when the master talks, you should listen to what he has to say. Okay? So Jesus takes the initiative. Stop. Jesus always takes the initiative. He is perfectly fulfilling the will of the Father. He's on his way to Jerusalem to die on the cross. He's on, he's perfect for, it's his time, it's God's time, not your time. Do we forget this all the time? Yeah, we always want God to deliver the goods on my time. I'm waiting, come on, let's go. Jesus is in control of all aspects, including when the great reveal is coming. You got that? So at the right time and at the right point, at Caesarea Philippi, this pagan thing, this gateway to hell, he says to them, who do people say that I am? Now, the debate was on TV last week or the week before, what do you do? Listen to the question, listen to the answer. Listen to the answer, listen to the question. This is how Christians learn, it's called the catechism method. Okay, so listen to the questions. Again, I, you know, I've, I've complained about this before. When a student puts a hand up and asks a question, the other people in the class look out the window and zone out or check their messages or something. No, if you want to learn, you listen to the question and you listen to the answer. Chances are the person asking the question is speaking for 20 people in the room that don't have the guts to put their hand up and ask a question. The questions, you know, the. Somebody gives a speech, and afterward, you know, uh, you watch uh, C-SPAN. I watch C-SPAN all the time. They have authors who write. They, they give a talk about their book, 
And then, you know, oh, Franklin Roosevelt did this. And then after that, there's question and answer period. That's the best part of the lecture. The question and answers. Listen to those questions. Here, Jesus takes the initiative and he says, who do people say that I am? Stop. This is a question that is still um, on the lips of many people today. The answer would be yes. Who is Jesus? He's a strange visitor from another planet. Ancient aliens dropped him off here. Oh, he was, a, he was a communist, a political organizer who's going to do a revolution. Or who was Jesus? He's a great and noble teacher, but I don't do anything that he taught me to do. Right? So everybody has a theory. He, no, he can't be divine because we don't believe in that stuff. So everyone has a theory on who Jesus is. Oh, he spent time in India studying under Hindu masters, the lost years of Jesus. Everybody has a theory about who Jesus is. Usually it's on the History Channel. You know, mysteries of the Bible. And they talk to some lunatic about what their theories are. They never talk to me about who Jesus is because I'm boring. I just say in the Bible, you know. They don't believe that. So everyone has a theory about who the Bible is. Now, the theories of human beings, ready for this one, are always inadequate. Human speculations fall short because they're human speculations. If you want to know about God, where do you go to learn about God? You go to the Holy Bible. The Bible is God's word for you so that you can understand. If God is infinite and you're finite, God knows it all and you don't know anything, why would you talk to other people who don't know anything and share your theories about who Jesus is? You look to the Bible and God tells you who he is on the pages of the Bible. It's extremely important. So who do men think that it, there's an infinite number of theories, but Mark boiled it down to just three. Ready? Who is he? John the Baptist. And other people say it could be Elijah or other people say are one of the prophets. Stop, stop, and stop. Okay, let's unpack this. What do you mean John the Baptist? We know from reading the Gospel of Mark, John the Baptist is beheaded by Herod Antipas. Maybe that's one of the reasons why Jesus is not in the domain or the territory of Herod Antipas. Everyone knew about this. It would be like, uh, I don't know, like the Kennedy assassination. Everybody knows about that. So everyone knew that John the Baptist was killed by Herod Antipas. And he was a good and righteous man who was murdered. So people thought, hmm, maybe Jesus somehow got like the spirit of John the Baptist, you know, like reincarnation or something. Now, does the Bible teach reincarnation? The answer is no. It is appointed for man to die once and after comes the judgment. You've got one shot in, in, in life and it's right now. You're not going to come back as a cow or a politician or something or, you know, no. You know, I was talking to Dave Barkstead last night. He's convinced that um, if you hypnotize him, he'll tell you that he was Napoleon in a past life. <laughs> oh, you know, or and then, no, he was also Alexander the Great, you know, and he was uh, Robert E. Lee. You know, he's all these great people. Well, the, the thing is, most people lead lives, what does Thoreau say, of quiet desperation. We, we're born, we live, we die, and no one even knows we're around. You know, I don't believe you, Pastor Mark. Okay, look outside at our cemetery. Who's that person over there? No one knows. Who's that one over there? No, they, they're forgotten. Even by their relatives, don't forget or don't remember them anymore. So very few of us are famous, world-changing people. Most of us are galley slaves and servants in the great game of life, the poor pawns of the great game of life. So the idea that somehow you can be reincarnated and come back, why would you want to be reincarnated and come back? Isn't that strange? Okay. So we're not Hindus. We don't believe in reincarnation. So no, it's not, he's not John the Baptist reincarnated. Other people said, well, maybe he could be the prophet Elijah. You know, in the book of Malachi chapter four, it says that Elijah is going to return before the revealing of the Messiah. So you ever go to a Passover Seder? Get some Jewish friends, right? They'll invite you over, have a great meal, great time. They have an empty place setting and a chair there with the door open and they're waiting for the prophet Elijah to come. Because when Elijah comes, then the Messiah will come after that and restore peace to Jerusalem. Okay, so many people are still waiting for, and what does Jesus say? John the Baptist is an Elijah-like character, the spirit of Elijah. So he's the, he's the coming of Elijah before the coming of the Messiah. Okay, he's not, Jesus is not the forerunner, he's not Elijah, he's, he's the Messiah. He's not the one who prepares the way, he is the way. See the difference? So some people say Elijah, 
And notice, all of these definitions fall short of he's the son of God, he's the Messiah. Right? They're all like, they, they, no one wants to admit that he could be divine, he could be who he says he is. No, so they try to keep him down here and put him in a box somewhere. God in a box to make him more convenient for us. And the third one is one of the prophets. In the book of Deuteronomy, second giving of the law, Moses on, on his way out, he's 120 years old, he's giving three long speeches. In Deuteronomy 18, he says, God will send a prophet like me. So one of the great themes of the Gospel of Matthew is Jesus is the new Moses and the new lawgiver. So some people said, hmm, he's a prophet. We've had 400 years without a prophet. He's, he's a Moses-like prophet that God has sent. Do we like Moses? Yes, we do. But Moses, again, is a man. He's not 100% God, 100% divine, or 100% man, 100% God. He's not Jesus, in other words. So all three of these fall short, and that pretty much includes like all human speculations. Then Jesus says this, and I want you to pay attention. Jesus says to them, to the disciples, us, he says, and who do you, you, say that I am? Got that? Now, what does that mean? You see, my two grandmothers, God bless them. They were, they were godly women, they were Christian women, and, I, and I, I thank God for them. Our whole family is based on a solid rock because of those two women, great, powerful Bible women, right? Now, do I get into heaven because I can say Olive Halverson and Evelyn Isaacs were Christians? Here's my paperwork. No, you get into heaven because of your relationship with Christ. I'm a Christian, I want you to be a Christian, but you can't get into heaven by saying, well, I heard Pastor Mark do a sermon one time, I, I stayed awake for some of it, and therefore I should go to heaven. No, you're saved by grace through faith in Christ, not by works, faith is individual. You have to be the one who decides to follow Christ, right? You can follow some politician or follow some worldview or so, follow some weird philosophy, and there's millions of them out there, there's a, the broad road that leads to hell is full of all kinds of interesting philosophies. And so the narrow road, the way of salvation, is Christ. The way of the cross, that's it. There's one way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. What? No one comes to the Father except by me. Oh, that's so exclusive. That's such a horrible thing. Just this last week, the Pope opened his big mouth. What does he say? Well, all religions are the same. He has good people from all religions. Is that true? Oh, that's a lie, right? He's not preaching the gospel. He's making up stuff. That's human speculation. That's called universalism. Universal means everybody's saved. Do you want to worship a God where everyone is saved? I think that's insane. Yes, please come into heaven. Look, over here, have a chair next to Hitler and have a uh, chair next to uh, Charles Manson and Jeffrey Dahmer. Everyone is saved. It doesn't matter what you do in this life, how many people you abuse, how many people you slaughter, how many people you rob, cheat, steal. Everyone gets to go to heaven. That's called universalism. What kind of a God would do something like that? I gave you the Bible, but you can ignore it and just do whatever you want because we're all saved. In fact, don't even bother coming to church. If we're all saved, why do you want to go to church? You're wasting your time. Go to the Rhinebeck Farmer's Market right now and get yourself some cabbages along with other people. Extremely important. So you're saved by the name of Christ and by no other name. Who do you say that I am? You have to say who Jesus is, right? Now, what does Peter do? At this point, Peter becomes the spokesman for the, all the disciples. So he speaks on behalf of the 12 from now all the way to the end of the gospel here, the end of Mark, okay? So he steps up to the plate. Now, do we like Peter? We like Peter. He's a blue collar working stiff dude. Right? He works with the fish down on the lake. His grandfather, his father did it. He would, he's buddy, his brother's Andrew. He works with James and John. The guy probably has a filthy mouth, you know, like from New Jersey or something. He, he sweats for a living. He works really hard. He smells like fish. He makes a lot of money. He's a working dude, right? The kind of guy I'd like to hang around with. Well, Peter, he also, he says what he thinks. Is that a refreshing thing? Yeah. I'm so tired of people that say to me, oh, Pastor Mark, it's nice to see you today. They don't really want to see me today. They're just saying it because they want my money or something, right? Peter tells it like it is. He says it 
When other people should, be, should shut up and not say it, he says it. You know what? It's a breath of fresh air. Thank you for being honest here. Okay? So Peter steps up to the plate and he opens his big mouth, right? And he takes Jesus aside and he begins to rebuke him. Okay, what does rebuke mean? I've been rebuked a lot in my life. Don't you ever do that? Yeah, it's a stern, it's a stern rebuke. It means like, what you're saying is crazy talk. You're nuts, you're a lunatic, right? Listen to me, I know more than you. What, I know more than you? The student is lecturing the master, the teacher, the rabbi about the right way to approach things. Is that a problem? Now I know in our academic community and the you know, public schools and so on, yeah, the students lecture the teachers and we should do what the little ones tell us to do. In other words, the inmates are running the asylum. In the classical world, the master is the one who speaks and the students listen. It's extremely important. You're not the, you're not the master, you're the student. After you have some life experience and have read your books and so on, then you're entitled to have an opinion, right? So Peter, he wants to be the master. I want to take Jesus' place. What do we call people who are against Jesus or want to take Jesus' place? The Antichrist, okay? That's what this is. So Peter is, he, he says, he says, uh, um, so, 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 so Peter, he speaks up and he says something good. He says, thou art the Christ, right? You're the Messiah. So that's right. But then he goes further and Peter rebukes Jesus. So it's, it's, a, it's a change here. So right, Peter goes from the mountaintop, yes, he is the Christ, to the lowest part of his career, which is saying, no, 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 I'm not going to let you go to the cross. You see how that works? He flips it. Okay? So thou art the Christ. Let's talk about thou art the Christ for a second, and then I'll get back to this. I'm going to backfill here. What does it mean, thou art the Christ? Isn't that nice? Isn't Christ Jesus' last name? The no. Joseph and Mary Christ family in Nazareth on their mailbox? No. Christ is a title. It means the Messiah or the anointed one. Messiah is Aramaic or Hebrew. Christ is Greek. Christos, Greek. It means the anointed one. Who's anointed in the Bible? Prophets, priests, and kings. And Jesus is the only person in the Bible that holds all three offices at the same time. It's called the threefold office of Christ. He is the anointed one. There are many people who are anointed in the Bible, like David's anointed, but he's not the Messiah. Jesus is the anointed one. So there are 333 Messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. I've gone through these before. We'll go through them all in detail another time, ZU or something. About half of them are prophecies that talk about the political military Messiah. There are two Messiahs in the Old Testament. The other one is the suffering servant. And when you read the Bible, you have to be able to make proper distinctions. You put some in this category and some in that category, or you're not gonna understand what the Bible's all about. So, Peter says, thou art the Christ. When Peter says, thou art the Christ, what does he mean? He means, you're the political military Messiah. And what is that Messiah gonna do? He's going to get an army, maybe up here in Caesarea Philippi, get a big crowd, and go all, march all the way south, and we're going to take over Jerusalem, and we're going to kill all the evil people that have corrupted the temple and purify it, kick out the Romans, get rid of the Herod dynasty, and Jesus will be sitting on the throne. He'll be the new King David. That's what Peter says when he says, Thou art the Messiah. Now, who believed that? Oh, about 99% of all people during the time of Jesus. You have to understand that. We are 2,000 years on this side of the cross. We know that he's not the political military Messiah. Okay? Again, I've talked about this before. Is your problem political? No. No. Electing the right person is not going to save your life or your society. Jesus saves you as an individual. Your problem is not political. I know it's hard to believe because they spend millions of dollars right now trying to convince you to go one party or another party, right? No, your problem is your individual. You have to come to Christ, not elect the right person and we'll be fine, okay? Uh, they make messianic claims on both parties do this. We're gonna save the world from apocalyptic events if you only vote for me, okay? That's heresy, right? So Jesus tells them, don't tell anybody who I am. Do not tell anybody. Why is that? Um, a lot of um, 
Christians today, we believe we're following this, not telling anybody about Christ. Well, guess what? Jesus doesn't want people telling, telling people who Christ is in 33 AD on the way to Jerusalem. Now, after the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, we're supposed to be sent out into all the world to make disciples, baptizing the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In other words, now is the time where we tell people about, who do you tell about Christ? Well, let me see, your family, start there, your friends, your neighbors, people around you, and don't be obnoxious about it, right? Be a good Christian citizen and people will come to you and go, why is it that everyone else I know is insane, but you seem to have a stable life? Because of Christ, that's why, okay? Christ gives you a, a, a beautiful life here and now with clear thinking, right? Good order. So don't tell anybody, Jesus is not going to be the leader of an army that's going to depose the Romans, right? Now, at that moment, Jesus shifts gears. You'd think he would just stop there. No, he has to clarify it. Remember, Jesus initiated this whole thing. Who do men say that I am? Now he's going to clarify it. He's starting general and getting into the very specific. He does a passion prediction. There are three passion predictions in the Gospel of Mark. This is the first one. One, two, three. Repetition of the Bible means it's important, doesn't it? If Jesus said it three times, does that mean we should ignore it and just move on? No. When he repeats something, you should pay attention to it. Here's the first one. Um, he says, he, he teaches them. Now, why does it have to be taught? Because it's an idea that is completely foreign to anybody's thinking. That's why. People read all of the political military stuff and they get all excited about that. They ignore the suffering servant things. Roxanne read Isaiah chapter 50. That's a description, that's a messianic prophecy of the sufferings of Christ as he's being tormented before he's crucified. Okay? People don't want to see that. They just sort of skip over it and focus on the victory stuff. Okay? So the Son of Man must undergo great suffering. The suffering servant. He must be what? Rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes. Who? The people in Jerusalem down here are going to reject him. Now, they're the ones a couple weeks ago that walked all the way from Jerusalem to try to humiliate him in front of everyone else, right? They're trying to destroy him. They don't, they don't, wanna, they don't wanna come to Christ. No, they, wanna, they want their own agenda to, to, um, uh, to exist at the expense of getting rid of Jesus. So they're plotting with the Romans to have him killed. And he will be killed. Mark doesn't get into detail and say he's going to be crucified but that's the Roman way of killing people, executing people. So it's implied. And we know more as we read on through the rest of the Gospel of Mark. Get into Mark chapter uh, 14 and 15 and 16 and you'll have all the details about it. And after three days rise again. Here's the thing. They choked on this. They choked on the idea that he's gonna be rejected in Jerusalem and be killed and they didn't hear the rose after three day stuff. They didn't hear it. Their preconceived notions are he's going to be a political military. They're, they don't want any part of he's going to die on the cross for your sins and rise again on the third day. It's completely foreign to them. It's a bizarre, strange opinion. Okay, Shocking opinion. Okay, And Jesus says this quite openly. It's not some hidden teaching. He's telling everybody there about it. Now this is where Peter, again, the spokesman, the one who got it right, that the Christ, now he steps up and he starts to rebuke Jesus. Okay? Now, again, the students do not rebuke the master. And what does Jesus do? Jesus stops and he turns, right? Because Jesus, Peter must be behind him, so he has to turn around this way. Here's Peter, and in front of the disciples, because it was a public thing, and in front of his students, he rebukes Peter. And he says, get behind me, Satan. Stop. Has Satan been at this old game before? The answer is yes. In the temptation of the Christ story, Satan offers Jesus the economic, political, and military temptations. If you fall down and worship me, all the kingdoms will be yours, political temptation, turn these stones into bread, economic temptation, leaping Lord, jump off the temple, and, and you know, the, the, re, re, if you do a miracle in public, everybody will believe in you. Satan is trying to derail Jesus to prevent him from doing what? Going to Jerusalem and dying on the cross. The temptation didn't work at the beginning, 
But all through Jesus' ministry, Satan is active, working and working and working. Satan never retreats, never gives up, never recants, keeps working and working and working and working, undermining and trying to derail the kingdom of God. Here, Satan got a hold of Peter and is using Peter as a weapon. Satan doesn't care about you. Satan wants to use you as a weapon. Here, he uses Peter, the number one disciple, the one who's probably like the closest to Jesus. Satan gets worms right in there and uses Peter's limited brain to try to derail Jesus. Jesus could have said, you know, you're right. That is a nasty thing. Let's just do the political military thing and march on Jerusalem. Have people tried this? Yeah, the Bar Kokhba Rebellion. No one knows about this one. This is 131 to 135 AD. Bar Kokhba, son of the morning star, said he's the Messiah, the political military Messiah, and they tried to do a rebellion and get rid of the Romans. How did it end up? It's a disaster. This is worse than the first Jewish war where the temple was destroyed. This is when the Romans killed all the Jews in Palestine and converted the Temple Mount into a, into a shrine for Jupiter or Juno, right? On top of the old Holy of Holies is a pagan shrine. This was a disaster for the Jews worldwide and it has taken them like centuries to recover from that disaster because they believed a political military messiah, they couldn't get rid of that idea. Right? The political revolution is your answer. They couldn't, get, they couldn't get rid of it. So Peter, he gets rebuked, right? And he's, he's an instrument of Satan. Then what does Jesus say? You, Peter, are setting your mind not on heavenly things, but on earthly things. Do we get into trouble all the time? We get into trouble all the time because we say things like, well, if I, if I was God, I wouldn't do it that way, right? We, we, we only function on the earthly level. We don't look up and see what would God have, what would Jesus do? What would God have you do, right? And that's our problem in life. We, we refuse to listen to the counsel of God, read the Bible, believe in Jesus. Instead, we do what we think is the right thing to do. And from our point of view, that's not a good thing. Relativism is a disaster. Everyone else is doing it, why can't I do it? I'm not as evil as the other people are, right? That's the Jerry Springer show stuff. You watch that and you go, well, at least I'm not as demented freak as the rest of these people are. I'm a pretty good person, aren't I? See how that works? So the standard is not what are other people doing, it's what does God tell you to do, right? Now, at that point, what does he do? He calls the crowd together and he teaches them again. He's a teacher, right? And he says, look, if you want to be my, who wants to be a follower of Jesus? I do, I do, I do. Okay, here's what you have to do. You have to deny yourself. You have to put your own agenda in the back burner and you have to say, take up your cross and follow me. What a nice thing that is, isn't that nice? But Donna has a cross hanging around her neck. Yeah, she must be very religious, right? Here's what it means. See this? This is a cross. What do they do to Jesus? They beat him to the point of death. Then they made him carry the cross through the streets of Jerusalem to Golgotha, the place of the skull, and there they crucified him. So carrying the cross means this. You walk with Jesus through the parade, a public degradation ritual. Being a Christian means you'll be mocked, you'll be spit on, you'll be maybe even killed for the gospel. Because the world doesn't want to hear the message of Christ. Your sins are forgiven, believe in Christ, amend your life, change your life, go by the Ten Commandments, lean a clean and sober life. The world doesn't want to hear that. Talk to the hand. Right? In fact, they hate you. If they could, they'd burn down all the churches and get rid of religion completely because they think religion is an impediment to social development. Right? So the message of Christ is an offense to the people in the world. I'm offended. You can't talk. You can't, I don't hear the gospel stuff. Well, that's what they're trying to do. Right? So take up your cross and follow me. And guess what? If you want to save your life, we want to save our life, don't we? Well, you save your life by losing it. It's a paradox. Paradoxical statement. And those that lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, guess what? Your life's going to be saved. People that take a hard stand against the, the, the world, the flesh, and the devil, a lot of times they are martyred. That's why we honor martyrs in church history. That's why we read about Dietrich Bonhoeffer and we go, 
Wow. If I was in his position, would I stand up and renounce Hitler and try to undermine the Nazis? Probably not. Most of us would say, I'll just keep quiet and keep my job. That's why he's a saint, right? So it means fight facing the devil, right? And if you lose your life for the sake of the gospel, and then look at this one. What will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? How many people do you know? You know, I, I watch sports once in a while. NBA players, they get a $100 million contract, $50 million contract, and what happens to them? Well, they're 35 years old, they can't play basketball or football anymore, and they're completely destitute. They wasted all that money on high living. Money is not your problem, right? If you were a Christ-centered person who believed in God and invested wisely instead of like blowing all the money on all the usual vices, right? And how many people do we know? They have all the money in the world and they're bitter and lonely and nasty people. What a tragedy. They missed the whole point of life. Life is not about how much money you get, right? Someday you're gonna die. And when you die, your idiot relatives are gonna fight about the estate. Some of them are gonna take the souvenir coffee cups that you've accumulated, right? Most people will just throw it all in the dumpster. My son-in-law, Chris, the lady across the street died. She's like 92 or something. And the bank's going to take the house and all the contents of the house, the family said, come and get, take whatever you want. They don't want your stuff. Your own family doesn't want all your stuff. So people like Chris, he's going to go over and pick out the things that he wants, probably sell some on eBay and use some of it. You know, Your stuff is not what the world is all about, right? And over and over again, we make this mistake. And they gain the whole world, but they forfeit their life. Indeed, what can you give in return for your life? On their deathbed, some people beg and plead for one more minute, one more hour, one more day. Now is the time for you to say to your relatives, I love you. Now is the time to enjoy hmm, the grandchildren. The grandchildren? What's it worth? My father is 92, 93. He's in a, in a assisted living. Does he care about money? Not really. He's got a lot of money. What does he care about? He really likes it when the grandkids come and visit him. He really loves it when, you know, little seven-year-old, eight-year-old Andrew says something to him. What a beautiful thing. What is that worth anyway? Oh, let me see, $4.83. It's priceless, that's what it's worth, right? That's what life's all about. It's about the relationships that you make, not the money that you accumulate. That's what Jesus is teaching us. Did we want to hear that? No, we live in a materialistic culture where we think the one with the most money wins. The one, the one with the most toys wins. The world is lost and messed up. And you want to be like those people? It's amazing. Then he says this, those who are ashamed of me and my words, hey, um, I'm a Christian, but keep a low profile on this. I don't want anybody to know. I'm like a secret Christian because I want to be popular with the right people at the Moose Lodge, yeah. okay? This is a sinful and adulterous generation three-hour lecture, the book of Hosea presents Israel as the bride, Yahweh as the groom. It's an Old Testament image over and over again. And when you, the bride of Christ, when you cheat on your husband, that's called adultery. It's spiritual adultery. It's one of the great symbols of the Old Testament. Jesus looks at that whole generation and says, you're a sinful and adulterous generation. You've rejected the Messiah who's standing in your midst right now and you're plotting and scheming and saying, we don't want, we don't want any Jesus who died on the cross. No, we want, we want a victory Jesus who's going to destroy the Romans. You see how that works? Right? So don't be ashamed of the cross. The preaching of the cross. These are the words of eternal life. This is the essence of the Christian religion. The death, burial, resurrection of Christ. That's the gospel. Right? And, and if you deny Christ, then what? Then the Son of Man will be ashamed of you. Do you want to be ashamed, have Jesus be ashamed of you when you face your maker? You want him to say this, well done, good and faithful servant. Think of those words. See, you're living for a higher purpose than most of the people out there in the world that don't, you know, don't care about God or don't care about religion. They don't, don't care about themselves. When he comes in his glory and with his holy angels. Again, death is not the end. 
It's the beginning, the gateway to eternal life. Your three score and ten here is nothing compared to eternity. Jesus came to save you for all eternity. For God, what? So loved the world, our messed up, broken world, that he came down to earth and dwelt among us. And what? Whoever believes in him, whoever, that means you have to believe. Doesn't mean, well, my family's always been a Christian. I don't really go to church, but you know, I know my grandma. No, it means you have to say, I believe in Jesus. I believe in him. And what is the reward? You will have an abundant life here and now, a blessed life, an orderly, a godly life now, and be with him for all eternity. You know, I've said this before, I'd be a Christian even if there was no heaven. Why? Because it, it leads me, it helps me to live a, an orderly life. Again, a lot of my friends from the old days, yeah, they're all dead and gone now. You know, drugs and alcohol, life got them, consumed them, ate them alive. Being a Christian helps you to live a godly and orderly life. God wants you to be, live in peace and have prosperity. That's what he wants to do. He blesses your life here and now, but he also blesses it for all eternity. Who do men say that I am? Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Very important uh, lesson today. Amen. Amen. Amen.